construction management, post construction stormwater management. And keep that in mind because there are completely different standards for construct management of stormwater during construction. Those are a completely different set of rules than the stormwater management rules. The stormwater management rules only deal with post construction after the development is completed and it's operating. So there's really two ways, two main ways that you get, uh, you wind up with a review of this against the stormwater management rules. So first is through compliance required by the Division of Land Use Regulation with the NJDEP. So obviously that is direct implementation by the department. That happens when you need a permit from the department's Division of Land Use Regulation, either say a, a CAFRA permit or a freshwater wetlands permit or a flood hazard permit or, or even a, a highlands permit and the project is also a major development. So all of those rule sets contain a requirement that if your project is a major development, you also need to meet the stormwater management rules. So even if you meet all the standards of the flood hazard rules and you're a major development, if you don't meet the stormwater rules, you can't get a flood hazard permit. The, the rules don't allow it. So you have to meet those rules in order to get those permits. The other way that you could be reviewed for the stormwater management rules is at the local level. Now, the review at the local level is actually a bit more complicated than it is at the department level. So there, essentially, um, we've issued permits from our, our Bureau of Nonpoint Pollution Control to all the municipalities, um, and these permits are called MS4 permits. MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And these storm sewer systems discharge into waters of the state, so we're required to give them permits, Najipti's permits, for those discharges. And a condition of those Najipti's permits is that they make sure that any of the developments they approve in their municipality meet essentially meet the stormwater management rules. But a municipality can't enforce directly against the stormwater management rules. They need to pass an ordinance of their own that is at least as stringent. So this is where the complications can come in because it needs to be at least as stringent as the stormwater management rules, but need not be identical. So municipalities could have more stringent stormwater control ordinances than what the actual state standards are. On top of that, a stormwater control ordinance is generally only applicable to uh, non-residential projects and, and residential projects that for one reason or another aren't subject to the residential site improvement standards. If it's a residential project that is subject to the residential site improvement standards, then it's reviewed against the RSIS, residential site improvement standards. And those basically say that you need to meet the stormwater management rules. So if, if a municipality does have a more restrictive ordinance, that actually winds up applying only to the non-residential parts and the residential projects that happen in the community just go straight against the stormwater management rules because that's what the RSIS requires. Okay, so the amendments that we're here to talk about are, this is an outline of what happened. So on December 3rd of 2018, we proposed these amendments to the stormwater management rules. Uh, there was a public hearing on January 8th, and the 60-day public comment period associated with that rule proposal closed on February 1st, 2019. So then we spent the next 10 months putting together responses to all the comments that we received, which is almost 400. And then we uh, submitted that to the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, on December 3rd, 2019, which is just meeting the one-year deadline that's required for us to file an adoption of a rule. And it was published in the New Jersey Register on March 2nd, 2020. The, the, these amendments came with a one year delayed operative date. So since it was published on March 2nd, 2020, the one year delayed operative date means that these amendments actually do not come into effect, they're not operative until March 2nd, 2021. Until that time, the current rules are still in effect. Now, there's a couple reasons why we used a delayed operative date. One is like I described on the previous slide, uh, at the municipal level, all the municipalities have to have stormwater control ordinances that are at least as stringent in the stormwater management rules. So they can't revise their ordinances instantaneously as soon as we adopt something. So they have a one year time frame set forth in their MS4 permits to make those, uh, make those changes to their ordinance. And that, that actually triggers according to the permit, the day that we notify them that their ordinance is no longer sufficient. And we did that the day the rules were adopted. We sent notices both by email and hard copy to all the municipalities, letting them know that they need to update their stormwater control ordinances. So that, top, that clock is ticking for municipalities. Now, the other reason we incorporated a one-year delayed operative date is because a lot of time and money is spent designing stormwater management. And it can be very complicated for a site. It can sometimes take years to get these things done. 
So in order to provide someone with a bit of fairness, uh, this gives them a one year window to finish whatever they're already working on and get it approved now if they can, or they know they can't get it done within that one year, then they know now that they need to design for the new, new rules and it's not a surprise at the end of the day uh, when they submit their application that there's new rules. So they have a whole year to, to think about it. Next thing I wanna talk about is what projects must comply with the stormwater management rules. So the subset of projects that happen in the state that need to comply with those rules are called major development. Now major development is already defined in the existing set of rules. And what you're seeing on your screen here is the definition that is in the amendments. Now again, this won't be effective until next year, but this is what the revised uh, definition of major development is. So there's a few things I've highlighted that are distinctly different, and I'm gonna go over each one of them. Um, but the first thing I wanna talk about is, is the intro to the definition. So now it's going to say major development means an individual development as well as multiple developments that individually or collectively result in one of the four following things. So this is just a clarification of our current implementation Basically, what this is saying is you can't subdivide or shrink into a bunch of smaller projects to avoid regulation. You can't say disturb 0.99 acres today and 0.99 acres tomorrow and 0.99 acres the next day and say, well, none of my projects disturbed an acre, so they're not major developments. No. Um, e even under the existing rules, the definition basically says that, uh, that it's based on the ultimate disturbance or the ultimate increase in impervious surface. So it was always part of the rule. This is just clarification of our implementation. To make it very clear that you can't, you can't break it apart into small projects to avoid regulation. Okay, so the next thing in the definition is the disturbance of one or more acres of land since February 2nd, 2004. And the disturbance of one or more acres of land was already part of the definition of major development, but now it's tied to February 2nd, 2004. And we added that because we felt that this needed clarity. If we are implementing the rules in a way where you're counting the cumulative or the ultimate disturbance that's happening on a property, sometimes someone could ask a question and say, well, what about a uh, disturbance that happened here in 1983? Does that count? Or in 1965, does that count? So this just gives us a bit of clarity on exactly what we're going to count. And that is anything that happened since February 2nd, 2000. The reason that date was selected is February 2nd, 2004, is the time when the stormwater management rules in their current form were adopted. So um, anything that happened after the time that the current rules were adopted, we're going to count as disturbance towards major development. The next part of the definition is the creation of one quarter acre more of regulated impervious surface since February 2nd, 2004. So the current rules say uh, the creation per acre more of new impervious surface and now this change to regulated impervious surface. Now I will talk about that a bit later in one of the slides, but essentially that's because there are some scenarios where we would want to count existing impervious surface towards the threshold because for one reason or another, it, it really is gonna have a significant impact on the water body. And again, since the quarter acre was already part of the rules, it is also tied to the February 2nd, 2004 timeframe. The next thing, which is completely added, is the creation of one quarter acre or more of regular vehicle surface since March 2nd, 2021. So this is about, one thing we'll talk about later is that we have changed the threshold for when water quality requirements are triggered to motor, motor vehicle surface instead of just generic impervious surface. I'll talk about the reasons why for that later. But because we made that change, we also had to include motor vehicle surface as a trigger for major development here. Because of course, we wouldn't want a scenario where something triggers the water quality requirements, but actually isn't even large enough to trigger major development. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. This is tied to March 2nd, 2021, which is the operative date of these amendments. Because this was not something that existed in the rules previous to this. We weren't, weren't able to tie it to February 2nd, 2004, nor would that be fair. Uh, it's tied to the date that we adopt, the date that these rules will become operative, which is March 2nd, 2021. And the last part of the definition is a combination of two and three that totals a quarter acre or more. I think that's pretty straightforward, but there is one caveat here or explanation I'd like to add, and that is that you wouldn't double count something under this. So let's say you're creating a eighth of an acre parking lot. So that that's asphalt, an asphalt parking lot. That would be... Um, regulated impervious surface 
and that would also be regulated motor vehicle surface. So you could say, well, I have an eighth of an acre of regulated impervious surface, and also it's an eighth of an acre of regulated vehicle surface, so together that's a quarter acre. But you wouldn't count it that way because you're double counting the same exact area. You, you don't do that. That would only count as one eighth of an acre of that type of project if it was completely on its own and not associated with any other developments or anything, would not rise to a major development. Another thing I need to add is that that's the definition that's used by the department if you come to us for review. If reviewed by the municipality, things are a little bit different. So through the RSIS, the, the RSIS itself right now says the ultimate disturbance of one or more acres of land. Now the RSIS hasn't been updated since we amended these regulations and, and the RSIS is done by DCA. I think there is some talk about doing an update, but I'm not sure exactly what form that will be in at the end of the day. So I can't say for sure, but as of right now, it says the ultimate disturbance of one or more acres of land. It does not include the quarter acre increase in impervious cover. And the other uh, way is the stormwater control ordinance, and that's really just based on how they defined it in the stormwater control ordinance itself. So that could be exactly the same as the definition of the department, or that could be as little as just including the one acre or more of disturbance. Anything in between, and it could go beyond what the department requires as well, uh, because they can be more stringent. So uh, that really depends, and you need to read the stormwater control ordinance, whatever municipality you're in, to know exactly what the trigger is in that situation. A little explanation there of why the definitions aren't the same, and, and, and I don't like it myself personally. I think it's very confusing. I would love to fix this if I could, but the reason is essentially that the, the federal MS4 requirements require that municipalities with MS4 permits address uh, post-construction stormwater management for anything that disturbs one acre or more. It does not require it for the quarter acre. That's that's a New Jersey only requirement. And the reason that's in our stormwater management rules is because the state was already doing that through the Flood Hazard Area Control Act rules before the stormwater management rules in their current form were adopted. So we took what we were doing in the stormwater in the, in the flood hazard rules and put it in the stormwater management rules and put the acre in, but we didn't force the quarter acre down onto the municipalities because that had previously been something only the state was doing and was beyond the federal minimum. Like I said, I would hope to straighten these out and make them all the same at, in one, at one point, but it's not, it's not something I have done yet or that we have done yet. Okay, let's see. The next thing I wanna talk about is the layout of the existing rules. So like I said, these are the rules that will be in effect until March of next year when the, when the amended rules come into effect. And this is the layout of subchapter five. We're gonna focus most of our discussion on subchapter five, because that contains really the design and performance standards for stormwater. Um, the other chapters are more about planning, but I will touch on one, one aspect in one of the other chapters at the end of the presentation, but for now we're gonna focus on subchapter five. So subchapter five is currently laid out with 5.1 being the scope, 5.2 being stormwater management measures for major development, and, and that includes a, a wide array of various things that apply to all major developments. Um, 5.3 is the non-structural stormwater management strategies, 5.4 is the erosion control, groundwater recharge, and runoff quantity standards all in one. 5.5 is the quality standards. 5.6 is the calculations of stormwater runoff and groundwater recharge. 5.7 is the standards for structural stormwater management measures. 5.8 is the maintenance requirements, and 5.9 is the sources of technical guidance. So this slide is showing the changes that we made in the layout of subchapter five. So 5.1 remains the scope and 5.2 remains the stormwater management measures for major development. But one major change we made to 5.2 is we took all the requirements that were in 5.7, which were the standards for structural stormwater management measures, which really are generic requirements to all structural stormwater management measures. I, I felt like that really belonged all together in 5.2. 5.2 was already generic requirements that applied to all major developments. So we put those all together in 5.2 and we also moved the erosion control requirement up into 5.2. Again, it's a generic requirement that applies to everything, to all major developments. We don't actually have any very specific erosion control standard in the stormwater management rules. It essentially says you need to meet the soil erosion and sediment control rules. There's no separate specific um, requirements here. So it didn't feel it was necessary to retain its own section in the rule. So we moved it up into the sections that apply to everything. Now 5.3 is the, one of the major changes of the rule. We replaced the requirement to use non-structural stormwater management strategies with the requirement to use green infrastructure instead. 
non-structural stormwater management strategy were moved into the planning section of the rules. Um, and then 5.4, because we were able to remove the erosion controls from here, and also because we removed the standards for structural stormwater man management measures up into 5.2, that cleared some space for us down below, and we were able to move the runoff quantity standard into its own section. We did move the calculations of stormwater runoff down into 5.7, um, but I think this, and I'll show one of the new rules here, I think this makes for a lot more straightforward rule. So we have scope in 5.1, 5.2 is the structure standards for stormwater management for major development, then we have the green infrastructure at 5.3, then groundwater recharge at 5.4, stormwater runoff quality at 5.5, quantity at 5.6, then calculations, maintenance, and sources for technical guidance. So now each of the major aspects of the rule, the green infrastructure, the ground recharge, the stormwater runoff quality, and the stormwater runoff quantity standards all have their own section within the rules rather than several of them being piled into the same confusingly long section. I think that hopefully makes things clearer. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is the green infrastructure standard. And the first thing to talk about there is the definition of green infrastructure, which is on this slide. So we've defined green infrastructure under these rules to be a stormwater management measure that manages stormwater close to its source by treating stormwater runoff through infiltration into the subsoil, by treating stormwater runoff through filtration by vegetation or soil, or by storing stormwater runoff for reuse. So I think the first question, and the question I've gotten a lot of times that everyone has here, is why doesn't this say anything about evapotranspiration? Well, I can answer that question right now. I've been waiting. Um, so basically, first of all, we're, we're talking about generally maintaining or managing the 100-year storm, right, with these stormwater management basins. So the 100 year storm is managed, and it generally you have 72 hours to let the basin drain, so it could have water in it for up to 72 hours. But the amount of evapotranspiration that's going to occur in a basin during a 72 hour period is really not significant enough to include in the calculations when you're trying to detain the 100 year storm. It could have tens or hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of water in the basin, and, and the small amount of evapotranspiration that occurs during that 72 hour period is really not going to make a significant impact on how much volume you're basing is now. So you wouldn't include that in the calculations. So that's part of why it's not discussed here, or at least it's not explicitly discussed. But I would also argue that if you look at number two, treating stormwater runoff through filtration by vegetations or soils, you're gonna really capture those basins that only rely on evapotranspiration, like bioretention basins that have under drains. Those, are, those, those fall into the category two and would be considered green infrastructure. I'd also like to point out that if you look at all three of the various mechanisms by which you be considered green infrastructure, you're going to see one very distinct uh, theme. And that is that there is going to be a volume reduction associated with each one of these basins. So if you have your traditional detention basin or a, a filtration MTD or something along those lines, the stormwater comes in and it flows out, maybe slower or cleaner, but all the water that goes in flows out. Anything that's listed here that's gonna fit the definition of green infrastructure is going to have some amount of volume that comes in, but whatever volume comes out at the end is going to be less. And that's because if you're going with part one of the definition, well, some of that water is gonna infiltrate. If you're going with part two, some of that water is going to be you know, trapped in the soil or evapotranspirated by the vegetation. Or if you're going for number three, obviously then some of it is stored for reuse, either for irrigation or for flushing toilets or something like that on the site. So, that is one of the main key goals of what we're doing here with green infrastructure. We're trying to switch away from using traditional stormwater management measures that just detain or clean the water to get it to a point where you're actually not discharging some part of that water. And of course, you don't discharge the water, 100% of the pollutants that were in it are also not discharged, right? So if you do infiltration up to the entire water quality design storm, well, that's 90% of all the rainfall events that happen during an average year um, there's no discharge of any pollutants because there's no discharge at all. Okay, and this is the actual green infrastructure standard itself. Basically, what the requirement is, is that you have to use green infrastructure BMPs to satisfy the recharge, quantity, and quality standards. And for the recharge and quality standards, you have to use small-scale green infrastructure BMPs. 
for the purposes of this rule, small scale means BMPs that have limited drainage areas. Now the drainage area limitation does vary depending on the BMP, and I'll talk about that on one of the slides later, um, but many of the BMPs have restrictions on the drainage area if you're doing using them for a recharge or water quality. We've also, in order to make this clear, we've created three tables in the rules that identify the BMPs and the performance of each and whether or not they can meet each of the three standards. So the tables are table 5-1, which outlines the BMPs that we consider to be green infrastructure and small scale, and those can be used for recharge, quality, and quantity. Then we've also created table 5-2. These are also green infrastructure BMPs, but they are more large scale green infrastructure BMPs. And these can be used only to address the quality, or excuse me, the quantity standard. So you still have to use the small scale for recharge and quality, but if you can't make quantity work because you're managing a 100 year storm with some of those small scale distributed BMPs, you then can use a large scale green infrastructure BMP to address the quantity standard. Now, table 5.3 is essentially BMPs that we would not consider to be green infrastructure. So these can only be used if you're getting some sort of waiver or variance from the rules. Uh, we're retaining it in the rules because there are a few ways that you can get a waiver, particularly the easiest one would be if you were some sort of a roadway project and you proved you couldn't meet the, the green infrastructure standard. We could still potentially do the, the project. You might just have to uh, do some mitigation or something off site. But um, you, you can still potentially use those non-green infrastructure BMPs that way. The rules also, despite the fact that we've created these three tables outlining all of the BMPs that we have in our manual, the, the rules do maintain an ability for a design engineer to propose an alternate to stormwater management design. Now, if it's to meet the green infrastructure standard, that alternate design still needs to meet the green infrastructure definition. And if it's, say, just a change to the bioretention BMP that we have, it's still going to need to meet that drainage area limit associated with that similar BMP. Um, now, this is not necessarily the best approach in most cases. Uh, we do have this in the rules for limited scenarios where an alternative BMP really is appropriate. But in most cases, it's much easier and simpler to just follow one of the BMPs that's already in the manual because those are essentially approved designs approved by the department already. So you don't need, as a design engineer, you don't need to prove that they're appropriate. They are presumed to provide whatever removal rates or whatever quantity control or recharge that uh, the manual says they can. If you, as a design engineer, are going to choose an alternative BMP, it becomes your responsibility to prove that the BMP is going to achieve those particular removal rates or the quantity or recharge capabilities. And that could be an onerous process. And you have to prove it to the satisfaction of whatever review agency you're going to. Could be the department, could be the municipality. Um, and also that review agency, if it's not the department, is required to notify the department when they do approve an alternative design. So while we, it's not an approval from the department that's required, they do notify us and like I said, we have indirect oversight of that program through our MS4 permitting program. So if we saw a municipality granting inappropriate alternative designs, that may become a compliance issue with their MS4 permit. Next, I'm gonna go through the three tables. Uh, this is table 5-1. So like I said, this is small scale green infrastructure BMPs that can be used for recharge quantity and quality. So we've got cisterns, dry wells, grass wells, green roofs, MTDs, now you might question why MTDs show up here, but there are actually a, a few kinds of MTDs and we're seeing more come in now for certification that would meet the definition of green infrastructure. More or less the ones I've seen so far are all proprietary uh, bioretention systems that just would replace, say like an inlet. Um, so you would replace that with a, a, with a tree box that is essentially a bioretention system. And so those would technically meet the definition of green infrastructure, so they, they would be considered green infrastructure. Um, other systems include pervious paving systems, small scale bioretention, infiltration, and sand filters, as well as vegetative filter strips. So like I mentioned earlier, some of these BMPs, in order to be on this table, come with drainage area limitations. So obviously the ones labeled small scale bioretention, infiltration, and sand filters, those are all going to have drainage area limits. In particular, for all three of those, the drainage area limit is two and a half acres. Manufactured treatment devices, like I said, since all the systems we've seen so far are essentially small, like proprietary bioretention systems, those as well would have that same two and a half acre drainage area limitation. Uh, a, a dry well has a drainage area limitation of one acre. That's consistent with what our limitation in the BMP manual has always been for dry wells. And the other BMP with a drainage area limitation is pervious paving systems. 
Now, the limitation for pervious paving systems is a little different than it is for uh, the others. It works, you take the area of pervious paving that you're putting in and you can have three times that area of regular pavement drain onto the pervious paving. So essentially you could have the parking spaces in a parking lot be pervious paving, but the drive aisles be regular impervious paving, and you have the, the regular drive aisles flow onto the pervious paving to get its treatment that way. As long as the, it's less than three times the size of the pervious paving, then it meets the definition or it meets the uh, drainage area limitation. Next table is table 5-2. And like I said before, these are, can only be used for quantity control. Again, they are types of green infrastructure systems. They're just large scale green infrastructure systems. So we've got bioretention systems, infiltration systems, and sand filters. So again, those are, those are repeats of the last table. The difference here is that these are not subject to the drainage area limitations anymore. So if you don't follow the drainage area limitations, they become large scale green infrastructure. And at that point, you can only use them for compliance with the quantity control standard. The other two BMPs here are standard constructed wetlands and wet ponds. And one caveat about the wet ponds here, if in order for it to be a wet pond to be considered green infrastructure, it has to have a native vegetative buffer as well as a reuse component associated with it. So that it will meet that definition of green infrastructure because without that, it won't meet our definition of green infrastructure. And here's table 5-3. These are the things that are green infrastructure. These are blue roofs, extended detention basins, Manufactured treatment devices. Now, keeping in mind this excludes the ones that do meet the definition of green. These are the, the, the MTDs that don't meet the definition of green. Sand filters. And so you saw that sand filters actually appear in all. And that's because there's two types of designs of a sand filter. One is a design that infiltrates and one is a design that does not infiltrate. So in table 5-1, where it's a small scale green infrastructure, those are sand filters that meet the drainage area limit and infiltrate if a sand filter doesn't infiltrate, it doesn't meet the green infrastructure definition. And then table 5-2, the sand filters there were sand filters that infiltrate, but they don't meet the drainage area limitations, so they're considered large scale. And here in table 5-3, these are sand filters that don't infiltrate. And of course, at that point, the drainage area limitation really doesn't matter. Um, also listed in this table are subsurface gravel wetlands and wet ponds. And these are wet ponds that don't incorporate that vegetative buffer or that reuse component. Okay, so the next part of the rules that I want to talk about is the changes we made to the water quality standards. So the existing water quality standards are triggered when you create more than one quarter acre of new impervious surface. And again, that is what the standard will be until March of next year when the, these amendments become operative. But when these amendments do become operative, it's going to switch from uh, impervious surface, generic impervious surface to motor vehicle surface. And that's going to do a few things. First of all, I think it makes our implementation of the rules more open and honest because despite the fact that the rules said that water quality applied to impervious surface, we did not and have not applied to water quality requirements to roofs or sidewalks because we don't consider them to contribute a significant amount enough of TSS to require any treatment. So by switching it to regulated motor vehicle surface, we are clarifying that we don't require the TSS removal for roofs and sidewalks because that's not motor vehicle surface. Unless, of course, it happens to be the roof of a parking garage or something, in which case it would be motor vehicle surface. Uh, the other thing that it captures, and I think this is more important, is that now you can't evade regulation by creating pervious motor vehicle surfaces anymore. You can't evade water quality. Um, I've seen many times where someone puts in a gravel roadway or a gravel parking lot in order to say, well, I didn't create any new impervious surface, it's gravel, I don't have to do water quality. And technically, under the way the rules are written now, that's true. And so this, this closes that, and that's no longer an option for people. Part of the reason is that uh, if you look at scientific studies for this, that um, you can see that there is a significant amount of, of TSS that comes off these uh, gravel roadways and dirt roadways if they're driven on by vehicles. And I think you can also see that if you, if you just see one of these places out in life when it's raining. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of muddy water that comes off these surfaces and it's because they're, they're not paved. It's eroding away some of that material that's there and taking it with it. 
So actually, uh, pervious motor vehicle surfaces contribute more TSS load than paved surfaces. So this is going to probably uh, push people away from using the pervious motor vehicle surfaces, if, particularly if they were trying to do it only to evade having to do the water quality requirements and the stormwater rules. But one way or the other, this will capture those and require water quality for those areas. And because we made this change, this is why we included regulated motor vehicle service in the definition of major development, like I said before. Okay, so we've also made some changes to clarify the applicability of the rules. We've added a definition of regulated motor vehicle surface, and we've added a definition of regulated impervious surface. This is particularly to address a couple of, of scenarios that are outlined in our frequently asked questions at 10.2 and are consistent with how we've been implementing the rules since 2004, but there are some scenarios where even though you didn't actually create new impervious surface, it really should be regulated as if it was new. Uh, First that comes to mind is you have a, a parking lot where the runoff currently just flows off into the woods that surround the parking lot. Particularly if this was in South Jersey during a smaller storm event, probably no runoff from that parking lot would ever make it to any water course. But you decide that uh, you don't like that for whatever reason, and you're going to pave and, or excuse me, you're going to curb and you're going to put in a collection system to collect this and discharge it down into the river directly. Well, now this river is seeing a lot more discharge that goes into it than you didn't see before. So even though you didn't actually create impervious surface, it's new. It's new to the water course because this water was never getting there before. So that is captured by these new definitions of regulated motor vehicle surface and regulated impervious surface. Another thing that is captured by them is a scenario where you do have an existing collection system already, but you decide to make the collection system larger and increase its capacity. Well, if you do that, that sounds like a great thing and probably is in many cases, but there is also the possibility that increasing the capacity of your system causes additional flooding downstream. And that's something that needs to be analyzed in accordance with the rules. You can't just arbitrarily make every system larger and expect there to be no adverse impacts. There would be in some cases. So that's also now counted as regulated impervious surface if you enlarge the collection system that exists there. So that will be captured as major development and then you'll be required to address the water quantity standard when you're doing that and we'll make sure that it's not going to adversely impact it. Still with the clarification about applicability, um, one thing that is in the existing rules that I think for a long time it was a mistake or an oversight that we had in our rules was under water quality we required that you met the water quality standard in each drainage area unless they converged on site. So that makes a lot of sense. You can't do your water quality all on one side of the property and have the water, the runoff on the other side go off untreated and say, well, on average, I met the water quality standard, even though they discharge to two separate water courses, for example. That doesn't make any sense. So the rules prevented that. But the rules didn't ha did not have that same standard in the water quality, or excuse me, in the water quantity or groundwater recharge standard. Now, I, I can understand that maybe it doesn't make quite as much sense in groundwater recharge, um, but for water quantity in particular, you could be discharging into two separate water courses. You do all your detention over here, you do no detention over here, so you're actually increasing the flow rate to that stream. And the rules technically said that was okay because on average across the whole site, you met the reductions that were required. Now, in practice, we would not really let someone get away with that if we could stop it because that could have very serious downstream impacts for, for property owners downstream. So we would try to encourage people not to do that, but the rules technically didn't prohibit it. And once these amendments come into place, they will. So now that's required for all three of the standards. You need to meet them in each drainage area on site unless those drainage areas converge on your site. The other applicability change that we made was moving the groundwater mounting analysis requirement from the groundwater recharge section to the section that applies to all major developments. Um, and more or less, that's because you could be proposing infiltration-based BMPs, not just for groundwater recharge reasons, but you could be proposing them for water quality reasons. And there's no reason that you shouldn't do a groundwater mounting analysis because it's for water quality and it's not for groundwater recharge. In fact, in general, you're infiltrating more water to meet the water quality standards and the groundwater recharge standards, so it's more important to do it under that scenario. So 
the rules the rules currently only had that in the groundwater recharge section which really didn't make a lot of sense and so we've now we've moved that out so it applies to all standards we've also created guidance for someone to use when doing a groundwater mounting analysis and that's now chapter 13 of our bmp manual which we adopted um, probably about a month or two ago next thing i want to talk about is the deed notice that's required for green infrastructure so if you're familiar with our current rules uh, if you're doing non-structural strategies there was a requirement for a conservation restriction for those non-structural strategies and for non-structural strategies the con conservation restriction made sense right you're preserving this forest that's my non-structural strategy well of course you need to put a conservation restriction on it so you can't just come back and develop it a year later because it was the only reason we approved your application but when we're talking about using green infrastructure instead, a conservation restriction doesn't make as much sense. It's too onerous, especially when we're talking about requiring distributed small scale green infrastructure BMPs across a site. You could have a housing development with 100 houses and rain gardens on every one of those properties. And with deed restrictions, no one could ever move their rain garden if they wanted to you know, put an addition on their house or anything like that. So with, with, with the deed notice instead of the deed restriction, they are set forth a mechanism by which they can go back to the review agency. They can get approval to modify or move their BMP as long as it still meets all the standards it was approved for in the first place, and then they can record a new deed notice. If that was a conservation restriction, they would have to go back to the commissioner of the DEP to get that deed uh, restriction lifted, which basically made it so onerous that most people would never seek to do that or they would just do it illegally. So this provides a clear and easy pathway as well as requiring on the deed that it describes the BMP, it describes what its functionality is, it describes what its location is, and there was already a requirement which is retained that they also attach the maintenance plan for that BMP to the deed. So it will have the description of the BMP and all that as well as the maintenance plan, so it should have all the information necessary for that BMP to function for its lifespan there on the deed. Now, mind if we're talking about a residential subdivision that the property owner won't be responsible for doing that maintenance. Um, but that will also be outlined in the maintenance plan. The maintenance plan has to identify who is responsible. So if you have this property, you'd be able to look at your deed and see the maintenance plan and see, okay, well, it says that the homeowners association is responsible. So they've been sending me letters saying I have to do something about it, but actually they're the ones responsible and you could show that to them and you would have to prove to show that you are not responsible. There's a few other changes that we made, uh, CSO related changes, combined sewer overflow related changes. So the first is that we clarify that water quality treatment is required even for discharges that go into combined sewer systems. So there is uh, an exemption from the water quality requirements for projects that have NGIFTES per site, excuse me, that have NGIFTES permits with TSS effluent limitations, numeric TSS effluent limitations. And that makes sense, right? If you're at, if you're at the wastewater treatment plant and your stormwater goes into the treatment plant and your treatment plant is removing 85% of the total suspended solids, you don't need to remove 80% TSS in accordance with the stormwater rules before you discharge into your treatment system that has an EGIPTES permit with monitoring requirements where we're going to actually see what removal rate you get at all times. Um, it's unnecessary to make someone do the, the, the treatment before that. But what we have seen some people do is say they were in a combined sewer community and their property was alongside the combined sewer they would be discharging their stormwater runoff into the combined sewer and they would argue, well, it goes to the treatment plant and the treatment plant has an EGIPTES permit with a TS, numeric TSS effluent limitation, so we shouldn't have to do water quality. But we all know that if that were the case, we wouldn't have a problem with combined sewer overflow. What happens is the combined sewer system can't actually carry that flow during storms to the wastewater treatment plant and instead overflows untreated into rivers and, and bays. So it makes no sense to try and make that argument that it's going to the treatment plant because we all know it doesn't get there. So this just makes that very clear. It's not exempt if you're discharging into a combined sewer system. It's only exempt if you, the property that the development is on, has its own NGIFTES permit with the TSS effluent limitation. The next change that we made CSO related is to clarify that water quantity control is required in tidal areas except discharges directly into lower reaches of major tidal water bodies. So what, what this is doing is really reversing the way the current rule is written. The current rule says that if you're in a tidal flood hazard area, you don't have to do water quantity control unless there's gonna be a downstream impact. Well, this puts, the way that's worded, puts the review agencies in a tricky position because now it's, it seems to be our job to prove that 
the development is, is going to have an adverse impact to make them do water quantity. And what we've really done is we've reversed that now. They prove that they're not gonna have an impact or they do water quantity. So the only way you don't have to prove is if you direct, directly discharge into a major tidal water body. And the way it's actually written is in, into uh, an ocean bay or inlet up to the first water control structure. So anywhere from the ocean bay or inlet basically up to the first major bridge crossing that goes over that water course is considered exempt. And you discharge directly into that, you don't have to worry about doing any sort of analysis. But it has to be a discharge that goes directly into it. You can't discharge into a drainage ditch that is six properties away from the major tidal water body because then there's six properties in between you could be adversely impacted. It has to be directly in there so we can be quite sure that there is no adverse impact because of course, you're not gonna raise the water surface elevation of the ocean or the bay by your stormwater discharge. Uh, we just need to make sure that you don't impact any properties that are between yourself and that, and that ocean or bay. And then the, the last CSO related change that we did was to create the option for a combined sewer community to create what we call a community basin. And this is a basin that multiple properties could get together and utilize for their quantity control. Um, and of course, still on site, they would meet quality and recharge on their individual sites. But we saw this as a way that certain combined sewer communities could redevelop areas and allow multiple developments to tie into a basin that they create and utilize to sort of reduce combined sewer overflow that could potentially be resulting from, from that area. Uh, and, and in particular, this has a requirement that you have to prove that there is a combined sewer problem in the area or a flooding problem that you're, that you're remediating by doing this uh, community basin. So this is really just an extra option we're trying to put into the toolbox for the combined sewer communities to try and help them address the combined sewer overflow that they have. As, as we know, that's a huge problem and they really need to have every tool at their disposal to be able to do that. I'm not sure if anyone will ever utilize this, but it was something we thought of and thought it was worth including for that reason. Okay, so with all those changes in mind, we have to make some changes to our BMP manual to keep up. So like I said previously, we finalized a new chapter on groundwater mounding. That's chapter 13. That was about a month ago we adopted it. Um, but we've also released two chapters for public comment, draft. And that's a revision to chapter five on how to do calculations, and that's revised soil testing guidance. So the major changes to chapter five, although I think we made it clear and add a lot more examples of various ways of doing the calculations. The major change that most people are concerned with is that we are shifting our focus from prohibiting groundwater, prohibiting infiltration as part of the quantity control routings to allowing it if you're following all the recommendations of the manual, you know, the right separation from seasonal high water table, the right soil depth, and you do the groundwater mounting analysis in green infrastructure BMPs only. Uh, and chapter 12, there's uh, changes for clarity, of course, as well. But the major thing that we're doing there is adding new soil testing requirements for distributed small-scale green infrastructure systems. Because we recognize that now if you're gonna be switching over to small-scale distributed systems, soil testing of two soil profile pits in every single BMP can become far too excessive, too costly, and also unnecessary. I mean, if you're, you have a small enough scale BMP, one soil profile pit could excavate the entire BMP. So doing two soil profile pits in its footprint doesn't, I mean, isn't even really possible, it makes no sense. So these are uh, slightly reduced requirements for distributed small scale systems. On top of that, we also uh, released a revised model ordinance for municipalities to be able to adopt. All they really need to do is add their name in there and make a few changes in, in the ordinance and they can adopt that and they'll be consistent with our regulations. Of course, they can also edit it. It's in a Word document so they can edit it as they see uh, necessary for their particular community. And additional changes to the BMPs will be coming. So in particular, to all our individual BMPs, the bioretention system, the infiltration basins, all of that are going to require some small um, changes as a result of all the changes we're making to Chapter 5, as well as the changes we made to the rule itself. And those are going to come after Chapter 5, because you wanted to see what comments we got back from the public on the changes we made to Chapter 5, and we'll incorporate, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fit, finalize Chapter 5 and incorporate those comments and then we'll carry over those changes into the other chapters. And so those, I think you should expect to see sometime this summer. Okay, and the last thing I wanna talk about is outside of subchapter five, this is the one thing I wanna talk about that's not in the design and performance standards and that's the variance requirements. So we made some pretty significant changes in the variance requirements. And uh, this slide shows basically what the existing variance requirements are. So a municipality could approve a variance or an exemption 
if they had a, a mitigation plan as part of their municipal stormwater management plan, and they identified what measures were necessary to offset the deficit created by granting the variance, and they ensure that mitigation happens in the same drainage area and for the same performance standard for which the variance was granted. Also, the municipality had to submit a written report to the county and the DEP describing the variance. But that's it. There's no, there's no other information whatsoever in the rules, the existing rules, about what needs to be done for a variance. So we've expanded on that pretty greatly and provided a lot more information. So first of all, the existing rules allowed a municipality to grant a variance really for any reason. There was no, there was no limit in the rules. So we've added some limitations. Now they can only grant a variance once these amendments become operative. They can only grant a variance if the applicant demonstrates that it was technically impracticable to meet the standards on their site. So now they can do it for any reason right now. And once these become operative, it needs, it's only limited to when it's technically impracticable. And that technical impracticability only exists when the standard cannot be met for engineering, environmental, or safety reasons. There's no other reasons that you can include. So for example, cost, can't be a reason. It needs to be something that you can't do for engineering, environmental, or safety reasons. Um, the next thing is that you also have to meet or, or maximize how much you meet the design and performance standards on the site. So whatever, just because you're getting a variance doesn't mean you say, well, I can only get to 78% TSS removal, so I'm not going to do water quality at all. I'll do it off site. No. If you can get to 78, you have to do 78 on site, and you just make up that 2% that you didn't get on site off site. So you still have to meet, do the maximum you can on site. And we also make it clear that now the approval of the variance applies only to the individual drainage area where you got the variance and for that particular design and performance standard. So it's not like you can say, well, I can't meet water quality here, so let me just do water quality for the whole site somewhere else. Nope, you still have to do it for the rest of the drainage areas on site unless it's also technically impractical in those drainage areas. And also because you got a waiver from water quality, doesn't mean, well, I don't have to do water quantity, I'll do that off site too. No, you have to do the other standards on site if it's technically practical. So if you can prove it's impractical for all of them, then you can do them all off site, but only if you prove it's impractical for all of them. And we've also expanded on the uh, particular limitations here as well. So they, they can uh, select projects from the municipal mitigation plan, or they can propose a project if the municipality outlines criteria in their mitigation plan for how they would evaluate that. We've added a caveat that it needs to be approved no later than preliminary or final approval of the major development itself. So keep that in mind, it's mitigation for the major development makes sense that it has to be done at the same time or before the major development. Otherwise there's potential for the major development to cause offsite adverse impacts. And we wanna avoid that. This also requires it be located in the same HUC 14 as where the, the variance was granted. Now the previous iteration said the same drainage area, but drainage area can mean a lot of things. I mean, the Delaware River has a drainage area that extends into multiple states. So drainage area didn't really provide much clarity. So now this is clear. It has to be in the same HUC 14, which is a defined drainage area. It has to be constructed prior to or concurrent with the major development. So same as the approval, it can't be, can't be later. It has to be constructed prior to or concurrent with the major development. It has to comply with the green infrastructure standards. And then the applicant or the party responsible for the maintenance of the major development has to be responsible for the maintenance. So you can't just turn the maintenance over to some third party uh, and make them responsible for your, for your mitigation project. No, you have to be responsible for it or the same person that's gonna be responsible for the major development's maintenance has to be responsible. And it can only be transferred from that entity to a public agency. And that's only if the public agency uh, agrees in writing to take it over. On top of that, the a variance needs to be submitted to the department and the county within 30 days. So submitting it to us was a requirement before, but there was no timeline. So this makes it clear that now it's required within 30 days. And this is just an explanation of what the variance is required or what's required if the variance is from green infrastructure. So you need to provide mitigation project that provides green infrastructure BMPs that manage an area uh, greater or uh, equivalent or greater area to the impervious surface of the major development that got the variance. So basically, you know, if you had to treat an acre on your site, you can't do a project that puts in a rain garden that treats a tenth of an acre somewhere else. No, you need to at least do an acre. Um, it also excludes vegetative filter strips and grass swales as being the only mitigation measures for green infrastructure. And that's because they would never have been sufficient to meet the green infrastructure standards in the first place on their own, so they aren't sufficient to be the mitigation. 
Uh, they also need to be sized for the water quality design storm at a minimum, and they uh, are subject to any drainage area limitations that would otherwise be applicable. Now, we've also done similar out outlines in the rule for each of the other standards, for the water quality, the water quantity, and the groundwater recharge standards. I'm not going to go through those all in depth uh, here, but you can go and take a look at the rules, and of course, you can always follow up with some, with some questions if you have those. And that actually is the end of my presentation for today. So questions, of course, you can ask in the chat window. You can type them at any time, and we'll get to them at the end of all the presentations. But if you don't think of it today or you don't want to ask it and have it answered in front of everyone, you can always reach out to me. There's my email address and the phone number for our office. You can ask for me or you can ask for really anyone from the municipal stormwater program and ask your question and we'll make sure that you get it answered. Thanks. All right, Brian, I have now made you a presenter. You have to unmute yourself. All right. There we go. Thank you. Touch that up here. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm actually uh, wearing two hats here. I'm a principal engineer with Kleinfelder. I'm also the chair of the stormwater committee for uh, NJAWRA. Uh, so a quick plug for AWRA, uh, New Jersey section. Um, we're a professional organization that works with um, uh, stakeholders dealing with all types of uh, water resources issues and aspects in New Jersey. Uh, dealing with research, planning, and outreach. And wanted to make a quick plug for a future event that's coming up on May 5th. It's by our Future Risk Committee. And we're having a webinar. Um, it's going to uh, feature Nick Procopio with NJDEP, who will be talking about climate change and uh, New Jersey water resource impacts. And um, you can go on to uh, there's a link there at the bottom right onto NJAWRA website. Uh, if you're interested in more information about AWRA, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I got my email address up there um, and phone number. So my talk today is going to be about uh, green infrastructure design and planning to address um, and design for these new NJDEP uh, stormwater rules. So just a quick overview of the presentation. I'll talk a little bit about uh, just generally impacts of development on stormwater, the stormwater runoff, and then I'll talk about uh, kind of an overview about green infrastructure. What, what is green infrastructure? What are the regulatory drivers uh, for green infrastructure? I'll kind of breeze through the new NJDEP stormwater rules because Gabe did such a, a great job uh, with his presentation going through those in depth. I'll then move on to just some general stormwater planning strategies to involve green infrastructure and go through some of the various BMPs. You know, we've been designing these for, for years um, and our experience with kind of the design approach of various BMPs and um, some photographs and pictures of previous projects that we've worked on, um, looking at some of those examples. So you're all probably familiar with the water cycle. Uh, this is uh, image that I'd like to show kind of what the urban water cycle looks like, how that changes um, the overall hydrology of an area when you have um, added impervious coverage. So you have increased runoff and increased frequent flooding. That's pretty much um, obvious that that would happen. You have paved areas, buildings, roofs, uh, producing a lot more stormwater runoff, but you also have a lot less infiltration um, going into the ground, which is, which is also uh, just as important so you reduce groundwater recharge. And then during times when uh, you have less rainfall, you have much lower dry weather flow in the streams, which reduces base flow and reduces water quality in our surface waters. And then um, just from the having motor vehicles, um, those uh, motor vehicle areas, increasing pollutant loadings that are flowing into our streams with that stormwater runoff. 
And this is a figure here looking at some of the percentages of um, all of the rainfall, how it divides up between runoff, infiltration into the ground, evapotranspiration, and how it changes as you increase that impervious coverage on a site or an area. And you can see how the runoff significantly increases as that impervious surface increases um, to suburban, urban areas and having a really large impact on the quantity of runoff uh, increasing and the amount of infiltration that's getting into the ground. So quick definition uh, generally of green infrastructure. These are methods that manage a stormwater close to its source, reducing not just the flow, but also the volume uh, by allowing stormwater to infiltrate into the ground, by uh, treating that stormwater runoff using vegetation for soil, or allowing it to be stored for reuse. And some examples here that I'll go over more in depth in a little bit, uh, pervious pavement, rain gardens, vegetated swales, um, cisterns and rain barrels, green roofs, vegetated filter ships are just some examples that I'll be talking about some more. I'm going to show two slides here that compare what a conventional stormwater design looks like uh, kind of typically compared to a green infrastructure stormwater design. And so this is a conventional plan here. You see there's one centralized detention basin being used. All the stormwater runoff from the site is piped to get to that uh, detention basin as quickly as possible. It's been stored and held back in that basin and released slowly over time. So there's no real reduction in volume, um, it's just held back. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty here. Everyone's Okay, I think we're back in action. Um, so this is uh, the conventional design, the centralized basin um, holding back water. So no, no uh, addressing that, um, that stormwater volume or real treatment of that stormwater runoff. Compared to a green infrastructure stormwater design where we have things like infiltration trenches for roof runoff. We have a small uh, treatment areas, rain gardens, fire retention systems, uh, to treat stormwater runoff from uh, close to its source throughout the, the site, distributed throughout the site. And we have vegetative swales, roadside drainage swales, as opposed to pipes to help slow down that water, reduce the time of concentration, um, and better manage that stormwater runoff close to the source. So this looks at um, a couple of hydrographs, which is the runoff flow rate over time. And these black hydrographs here shown are, um, you could think of that as a pre-development condition hydrographs. And I'll show here kind of how the post-development post hydrograph might look um, on a conventional approach versus a low impact development green infrastructure approach. So the blue line represents that conventional approach and we are um, holding that water back and releasing it slowly over time but the volume is really not being addressed. And you can see that the area under that curve is really pretty significant and higher than the pre-development hydrograph. And so this is looking at just peak flow reduction. We're just lowering that peak, holding back the water, but not addressing the volume. So the volume increases. This is a hydrograph showing what the green infrastructure approach might look like. And it's worth noting that in the quantity requirements and the stormwater rules, both of these approaches are allowed. So this is kind of the match uh, pre-development hydrograph approach. And you can see that the hydrograph is below the pre-development hydrograph over the course of the storm. And that um, also reduces runoff volume. So we're matching the hydrograph and we're mimicking the natural hydrology. So why um, should we use green infrastructure in New Jersey? Why are, we, why are we looking at green infrastructure? Well, we obviously want to address stormwater runoff uh, better, but there's lots of other ancillary improvements um, and benefits of using green infrastructure. Things like community engagement, providing green communities. Um, so addressing flooding, look, flooding also looking at uh, reductions in combined sewer overflows, 
uh, less reliance on potable water, and incre increasing habitat for wildlife and increasing property values. We're also looking to do this to meet regulatory requirements, uh, not just with these new stormwater management rules, but green infrastructure can have a big uh, benefit for meeting uh, non-point source permitting requirements, uh, tying into the MS4, Municipal Stormwater Regulation Program. The TMDLs um, are looking at um, reductions to non-point source pollution, which green infrastructure can help address, and addressing the CSO uh, permitting uh, program by reducing volumes getting into our uh, combined sewers. Uh, Gabe went over this in, in detail here, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the stormwater rules, but I'll, I'll breeze through this section because um, it was covered so well already. But this just gives a quick timeline. Um, the key things here are the new rules were published in the register on March 2nd, um, and the operative date of the new rules, as Gabe mentioned, is one year later, so March 2nd, 2021, and I provided a link here um, where you can get the uh, adopted regulations. And this just gives a quick bullet list. Um, this is kind of everything that Gabe went through. But these are what I view as the major changes in the stormwater management rules. So the biggest one is the first bullet requiring use of green infrastructure to meet um, the major components of the stormwater rules. So the groundwater recharge, stormwater runoff quality, and stormwater runoff quantity requirements. The non-structural strategies requirement has been moved. Uh, so it's no longer a design and performance standard and it's been moved to the planning subchapters. There's been new green infrastructure standards that have been developed. There have been uh, changes in the definitions that Gabe mentioned to major development, <coughs> regulated impervious surfaces, and regulated motor vehicle surfaces. So those are all key, uh, key definitions that have changed in the rules. What I view as a big change here also is that the BMP manual is actually written into the regulations now. So it's codified into the, the rules, giving it some more teeth. And, um, uh, it's worth noting here that there are some new draft chapters, specifically chapter five is a major one that is out for comment right now. There are requirements now for design and acceptance of alternative BMPs if they're not covered in the BMP manual. Um, some significant new and modified waiver variance and mitigation requirements and some clarifications for uh, discharges into CSO systems and for the use of community basins in CSO areas. So I will also kind of go through these pretty quickly um, since Gabe already went through them, but this is the, the main, this uh, uh, preferred green infrastructure to be used for meeting quantity, quality, and groundwater recharge. So these BMPs um, are um, really flexible in that they can meet any component of the regulation. And so these are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on. These are the smaller green infrastructure BMPs, um, like cisterns, grass whales, uh, pervious paving, fire retention. Etc. The next kind of, I'm calling them tiers here, the second tier, these are BMPs that can only be used for quantity. And so these are these larger systems, um, so not the small scale, but larger fire retention basins, infiltration basins, uh, constructed wetlands, and wet ponds. So they can be used for groundwater, re uh, they can be used for groundwater recharge and quality only if you get a waiver or variance. Uh, one thing that's interesting here is that extended uh, detention basins, which many of you are used to designing is not on this list. So um, you're gonna see a lot less of those conventional detention basins being used in designs. And finally, tier three, or these are PNCs that can only be used with a variance or waiver. So these include extended detention basins, uh, non-GI manufactured treatment devices, um, and uh, sand filters with that under uh, sand filters with under drains that don't infiltrate, and so these are are less preferred in the regulations. Um, this is really important because this defines what small scale and large scale. So this is the maximum contribu contributory drainage area to be considered a small scale system here, and most of the um, like the bioretention systems, infiltration basins, the sand filters, they have a maximum contributory drainage area of two and a half acres. And this means the entire drainage area, contributory drainage area, not including the area of the BMP itself. So given that information, I'm going to move into um, kind of an overview here of um, how we go about stormwater planning in this green infrastructure um, approach. 
And one of the big changes is that we have to start thinking of stormwater management from the beginning of the project. It has to be part of the planning. Um, it's not like the old days where you can just set off a corner of the property to be your basin. Um, you have to start thinking about how we're gonna deal with stormwater uh, management and using green infrastructure so that you can incorporate it into the entire uh, site plan. And I like to look at kind of three stages here that you look at kind of in order going top to bottom here. And these are the different planning tools and methods you can use. So starting at the top, you have your non-structural strategies and low impact development approach to the, to the site planning. So things like minimizing impervious surfaces, using vegetative conveyance instead of um, hard pipes and channels, uh, preserving wooded environmentally sensitive areas, trying to disconnect impervious surfaces as much as possible. Those are some examples of some strategies that you can use to reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that you have to treat using the next two phases or next two stages here. So the second um, is this green infrastructure. And we wanna focus on this to manage as much stormwater runoff as we can um, in order to meet the new stormwater regulations. So things like rain gardens, pervious pavement, uh, bioswales, these are the smaller, close to the source type stormwater BMPs that we can use to reduce stormwater runoff that's going downstream. And then finally, there's um, this last section, it's uh, structural best management strategy. So we have still quantity issues that we have to deal with after using green infrastructure. These are the larger systems like wet ponds and constructed wetlands that we can use downstream to meet the stormwater uh, quantity requirements of the stormwater rules. And I'll be focused on here on, on the green infrastructure BMPs uh, moving, uh, moving forward for the rest of my presentation. So one example of a green infrastructure BMP um, is bioretention systems and rain gardens, a small scale bioretention and rain gardens. And these are uh, really flexible, uh, adaptable type BMPs um, since they can be used to manage quantity, quality, um, groundwater recharge. They can manage stormwater from um, paved areas, motor vehicle areas to provide that treatment. Um, I've given two, uh, from, the, from the BMP manual, two options of how they can be designed. Uh, the first on the left is a bioretention system with an underdrain. So you have this planting material um, un, uh, uh, with a sand layer underneath that, and then a gravel underdrain layer that's used. So this is typically used for um, areas that have poor permeability of the underlying soils. And then on the right, we have a bioretention system without an underdrain that's designed to infiltrate into those underlying soils um, to provide infiltration and groundwater recharge. And these photos in the top left is a small um, rain garden that we designed as it's being constructed. And you can see that filter fabric being used on the sides of the system. Um, there is an underdrain in, uh, in that system and an overflow. The bottom left is uh, when I was the, uh, on the Lawrence environment, Lawrence Township, Environmental Resources Committee, we did a rain garden um, in, a, in a public space there. That's us working on a rain garden, doing the plantings. Um, pretty simple to, to build these types of systems. And then on the bottom right is a, um, on the right side of the fence there is a linear type bioswale that was used for a, uh, a public project up in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts along a reservoir. The next type of systems I want to give you an overview of is uh, pervious paving systems. Um, these are great for trying to manage uh, both quality and to try to get um, these impervious areas reduced so that we can take the stormwater runoff, get it into an underlying um, gravel storage area, let it infiltrate into the underlying soils where we have good, good permeability of the soils beneath it. They can also be designed with an underdrain um, as required. On the uh, top left here, I took this picture a couple days ago when we had that big um, rainfall uh, thunderstorms that came through. So you can see the, um, the parking spaces on the left there are on pervious pavement, whereas the driving aisles are standard asphalt pavement. And it was pretty impressive to see, you know, how much visual stormwater runoff you, uh, from that uh, standard asphalt, and then the pervious asphalt was completely dry water was infiltrating down um, through the pavement um, and into the ground below. Uh, some other examples are um, interlocking pavers in the bottom left that have a permeable um, area between the, uh, the voids 
of the uh, pavers. And then a similar idea on the bottom right, these are turf pavers where you have soil that gets placed in those voids and you can, um, you can grow grass and maintain that area. We often use these for you know, parking areas or um, uh, driveway areas for access drives uh, that aren't used quite as often. Vegetative filters and swales are, are great ways to try to disconnect stormwater runoff um, from paved areas and get that stormwater runoff not into a pipe getting away from your site as quickly as possible, but into vegetative swales um, or vegetated areas that can uh, infiltrate, retain that stormwater runoff, uh, treat it, and get it recharged back into the groundwater. And on the right, I have a uh, from the BMP manual, kind of the standard uh, grass swale um, design parameters there, and then a on the bottom right, uh, uh, detail we have used previously of using gabions to provide check dams to further hold back that stormwater runoff and provide infiltration into the underlying soils. Um, I want to talk about dry wells and cisterns. These are great ways of managing um, relatively clean runoff. So typically we just use um, areas that are coming off of roofs, for example, or stable vegetated areas. That are clean stormwater runoff that we can get into um, into the ground, um, either into uh, you know concrete dry wells that have um, openings around it that can let the water out into the ground, perforated pipe um, in stone. I have some details that we've used previously on the right. Uh, this is a project that we worked on that actually had um, uh, specific chambers to retain uh, store that stormwater runoff uh, that was wrapped in um, open graded stone. That would allow that stormwater runoff to infiltrate into the ground. And on the bottom left, uh, this is from a Rutgers project in Clark, New Jersey, where they actually uh, designed and constructed a green uh, car wash. And so this is a cistern that was used to take the runoff from a roof, um, and they use that um, to to run car washes in that community, uh, reusing that stormwater runoff. Uh, green roofs are another uh, example of ways to reduce that impervious coverage, uh, vegetating these areas that typically would have a ton of runoff coming off of them. And I have some uh, figure on the top right showing the typical components. So you have the growing media layer, a filter layer, uh, underlying drainage layer that lets that water um, drain away from the green roof once it is um, uh, drains through that growing media. And you have a protection fabric, root barrier, insulation, uh, important to have a waterproofing membrane. Um, also, there's often a, a leak detection system that's put in place and then all built up from the roof deck. And these can be used top, the top left photo here is from Duke Farms. They have a canopy that's using a green roof system. Um, the bottom left, the Water in, uh, Watershed Institute. Um, so they have a green roof system um, that covers a good portion of their roof. And then on the bottom right is just a photo um, from a library at Tufts University, which is where I went to uh, college, and um, they have used uh, different uh, sections of planting areas that um, create a green uh, roof portion on that uh, library. Uh, so this is from a project that, that we worked on, uh, also up again in, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and this is a way to incorporate different aspects uh, and different types of green infrastructure BMPs into an overall sustain sustainable streets approach to stormwater management. Um, great for urban areas where you don't have a lot of um, space for large basins, but they incorporate things like rain gardens and bioswales along the roads, uh, using permeable pavement for portions of the cross sections of the road, like the bike lanes uh, in this case, uh, using tree planters to help infiltrate that stormwater runoff, reduce it from going into the sewers or combined sewers uh, in that area. Uh, and so there's a lot of benefits. There's a, uh, the, obviously the stormwater management, but also a green a greening of the overall area, improving aesthetics. There's traffic calming improvements, um, improving pedestrian accessibility. So there's a lot of different benefits from this approach. Hold on. Give me one second. 
Sorry, another. Uh, get back into the presentation here. All right, hopefully everyone can see it. All right, so this is an example of green infrastructure designs for residential, uh, both low density residential and high density residential, how we can um, use different technologies on a residential lot. So a low, low residential area using fire retention rain gardens on the different uh, lots, using uh, rain gardens, grass swales, disconnecting stormwater runoff from roofs, um, using permeable pavers where, um, where possible. And then on the high density area, using things like dry wells, infiltration trenches um, to get that stormwater runoff into the ground using um, pervious pavement, uh, trying to disconnect stormwater runoff and minimizing impervious, impervious surfaces. I wanted to provide a um, quick overview here of a project we worked on that's more of a commercial area. And this was a design which used uh, vegetative swales along a parking lot to um, retain, uh, hold back stormwater, um, get away from the, the approach of hard pipes. Uh, we used a bioretention um, island here. So it's a way to incorporate bioretention into kind of a parking lot plan. And we took an existing detention basin and we kind of, we modified it to take away the concrete low flow channels using stone to recharge it. So we're naturalizing this detention basin to improve its functionality. And this is some photographs from that site. Um, you can see the vegetated swales with check dams that were designed, the uh, uh, fire retention island. So instead of these mounded um, mulch islands between spaces, we can actually create depressions and storage for stormwater runoff to reduce and uh, treat that stormwater runoff. And then I wanted to go through a project that we worked on up in Cambridge, um, adjacent to a reservoir um, for drinking water. And so this is a really important project for them to create a riparian buffer um, between the urban area of, um, of Cambridge. This is near um, Fresh Pond Parkway and Alewife up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so we reoriented a, a perimeter road that went right along the, uh, the reservoir and we bumped it out and realigned it with a old railroad bed that needed to be capped anyway. Um, and so we were able to provide this riparian area along the reservoir and use that for stormwater management by uh, incorporating this as a, a bioswale. And at the same time, we used it to create these berm areas along the other side of the perimeter road to create this park-like feel in the area. Um, this project also involved um, community gardens um, that were uh, constructed to allow for um, allow for garden access for the community um, in the urban area. And so just showing some photos from that project of how we could incorporate green infrastructure and improve the aesthetics. Um, there on top left shows the bioswale on the left side here, the relocated perimeter trail, and then the berms on the right side, um, creating this park-like feel, improving the aesthetics, improving the stormwater management um, and water quality um, along the along the reservoir. Another picture on the right from a different angle. This is a photograph of the community gardens that were constructed. Um, so this is a real uh, way to use uh, green infrastructure to, for, as a part of a community asset and use uh, green infrastructure for stormwater management, um, creating habitat um, in these otherwise uh, urban areas. And with that, um, we'll hold questions for now. You can post any questions on the chat, but I wanted to provide a list of really good resources here. Um, uh, looking at the uh, BMP manual, uh, NewJerseyStormwater.org has links to the amended stormwater rules. Uh, New Jersey Future has a number of very good guides and toolkits that I wanted to develop. There's a developers green infrastructure guide that's available and a uh, municipal toolkit through New Jersey Future. So those are both really good, um, really good tools that you can link to um, and check it out that provide example projects, um, planning guides, and so on. There's also a Rutgers Green Infrastructure Guidance Manual for New Jersey. That's a really good resource. And then um, 
NJDEP stormwater maintenance guidance and stormwater uh, training literature. Okay, well, thanks everybody. All right, Brian, thank you very much. And now, in a second, Clay, I will make you the presenter. Okay, let me know when you can see everything, Mike. <clears throat> All right, hang on, we can hear you and see you. And you are All right. now the presenter. Before you start, Clay, I just want to, because there's been a couple questions. Uh, we are recording this presentation. I did start a couple seconds or so late. Uh, and we will be sending out a link to that recording as well as the presentations. So with that, Clay, uh, we can see your presentation and you're on. Okay, great. And uh, I saw a couple of the questions there. I'll try and incorporate them in, in where I can. Um, okay, so thanks a lot, first of all, um, Mike um, and the Watershed Institute for, for having this and uh, New Jersey AWRA as well. Um, so I'm really, really uh, thankful for the opportunity. Um, and we also got some some good uh, some good info already. So um, as Mike said, I'm batting cleanup. Um, I'll go through this, and hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. Okay. Um, so. Um, What's the big picture? The, the real brief elevator speech here is uh, the DEP made a number of improvements to the existing rule. Um, and I just say a number of improvements, but there's really been some overall reorganization and streamlining and some added flexibility um, as well that Gabe went into great detail on. But the, the big, the big, uh, the most notable part here is that is that green infrastructure is required to meet the, uh, the three performance criteria. I had this, uh, this was intended to be like a Ten Commandments kind of thing here. It says, thou, thou shall not flood thy neighbor's property nor pollute thy water. In hindsight, it looks more like a tombstone. So I don't, I don't think that was particularly what I was going for. But, um, you know, the, the core of that is, is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but how we get there is going to be a little different. So a um, little overview. I'll go I'll talk a little bit about green infrastructure in general, and we'll get back right back to the regs, um, what's old and what's new, how we think this will change applications, and what are some key things to look for. And then I'll be pretty quickly on items five and six. Um, so everyone probably is aware yesterday was um, Earth Day, it was 50 years, um, and you might be asking, um, why am I hearing about that presentation? So I'll try and make that connection, albeit kind of weak, but um, but I think there is a connection to be made. Um, a more general look at the term green infrastructure, um, in, in my opinion, it's, it's more than just stormwater BMPs. Um, it's, it's an, an approach to design um, with a focus on natural processes. So making um, natural processes, natural systems, um, work in our favor or engineering them, creating them. So this could be things like wetland creation. Uh, this is a picture from uh, a site of ours. I think this is in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a wetland um, creation project up there. Floodplain reconnection, for example, living shorelines. I mean, these are all examples of green infrastructure, not what we um, signed on here to learn about today, but as a broader view. Um, is it new? Yes, in, in, in practice, it, it kind of is, um, but it's, the concept itself is not new. Um, because of the 50 years uh, Earth Day, I, I had to include uh, one of my favorite references to a, a book here. If anyone's interested, everyone has a little more time to, uh, to read books, uh, considering the current situation. Maybe this is one to pick up. Uh, Design with Nature, that is about 50 years ago now, um, and, and this author was a big part of the Earth Day movement um, locally here, specifically in the Philadelphia region. Um, and they, this is an example project from the early 70s that, that they worked on. And a lot of these kind of cartoon diagrams are very relevant to uh, what we're talking about today. So you see stuff like, um, I'll zoom in on this because you probably can't read it. 
use roads and berms and check dams and swales to impound runoff by blocking flow over permeable soil. Well, that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, from a hydrology standpoint, um, you know, it almost looks like they had s some idea about groundwater mounding in this figure. I'm not sure what was really going on there, but um, uh, just zoom in on these, um, you know, existing channels, create natural swales by introducing layered plantings of native, ve native vegetation, um, and then provide adequate storage through temporary storage ponds. So, um, you know, this, this, this particular guy was obviously forward thinking, um, but, but here we are. Um, and what we're going to, uh, what we've, this whole um, webinar is focused on, of course, is green infrastructure as it applies to stormwater, um, stormwater management. So again, an old early 70s diagram here and a, and a more current, this is a, a retrofit rain garden project that we worked on, um, but the concept is, is all the same. So, um, uh, as Gabe introduced, um, the new uh, amendments to the rule have a definition for green infrastructure. I think it's, it's a pretty good one. Um, means a stormwater management measure that manages stormwater close to its source. Uh, I'll come back to that, but I think that's an important part of this definition. And then as he stated, treating runoff through infiltration uh, into subsoil, uh, filtering it through vegetation or soil, or in some cases storing it uh, for reuse. So uh, this is kind of an interesting aside uh, factoid maybe, this would go into that category. Um, and I have a little statement here, Southern New Jersey's own self-reproducing brook trout population has these same processes to thank. So what the heck am I talking about? Um, the brook trout is the state fish for New Jersey, if anyone didn't know. And if you're familiar with trout, you would know that they have no business in South Jersey. Um, but uh, this one does have, there's a small population and they survive in this very small limited tributary that is, that's a photo of it there, it's tiny. Um, and a lot of these same processes that we're now relying on to treat stormwater um, are what keep this kind of unique um, population, um, you know, going in this particular tributary. Now, there's no stormwater management in this tributary to speak of whatsoever. In fact, it's probably 1940s, 50s uh, development, um, but it's a very steep um, catchment in the coastal plain which means that there's a lot of um, uh, surface and groundwater interaction and specifically temperature and other water quality parameters um, are able to be maintained that, such that the, the brook trout, which is very sensitive to water quality and temperature, um, can, uh, can procreate and, and maintain a population there. So a little bit of a diversion, but that's, you know, that's what, you know, that's water quality and that's what we're here for. And we can learn from, from these natural processes and, and now they've been applied to the stormwater regs. So um, I also have this time-lapse photo, one growing season. This is from a, I guess this would be close, most closely a considered an infiltration basin according to the New Jersey BMP manual. And it's just one growing season. And you can see that when properly designed, these systems are really living resilient systems. They're, they're biologically um, alive and, and everything that you see going on in this six month time lapse, the same kind of processes are going on underground as well. And that's keeping that soil permeable and keeping this system functional. And this particular BMP has been in the ground for I think 18 years. And last I heard it was functioning uh, great. So just, just keep that in mind that these are living systems. Um, or I should say most of these are living systems. So what is green infrastructure? We talked about the definition. Um, what does it actually look like on the top? We, this is a, a, a detention basin retrofit that, that we, uh, we completed. It's actually a basin. You can, maybe you can pick out a berm in the background there, um, but the property owner wanted something that was 
a little more functional from a water quality and a um, ecological standpoint. So um, it looks something like that. And then on the bottom right, we have another system, a subsurface infiltration system that would technically also um, meet that definition. And we hear a lot about the city of Philadelphia and the city of Philadelphia is doing a lot of great things. A lot of the private development in Philadelphia, the green infrastructure that's going in is gonna look, tend to look more like the, the bottom photo because of the, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, the cost of land. Um, is, it, is it green infrastructure? Well, uh, I, guess, I guess it depends on your own definition, but, um, but that's what a lot of it is. So, um, what is maybe not green infrastructure? Um, this is a, a, a all too typical photo of a detention basin in, in New Jersey. Um, you've got your concrete low flow channel, your, I guess that's called a left turn only retaining wall splash pad or something. Um, they're um, directing the, the runoff towards the outlet structure, your mosquito habitat. Um, and, you know, there's better detention basins than this out there, certainly. But I have the note here that these may be forced into extinction. And there's an asterisk there that that is, well, um, you know, you still have to manage your peak flows, your water quantity requirement. So you're going to still, you may need these, but um, you're not going to meet, um, as Gabe detailed, you're not going to meet your groundwater recharge and your water quality with, with one of these at the end of your um, development in, in many situations. So, um, uh, so anyway, um, so what's old and what's new? Um, the three main performance metrics uh, remain generally the same. I, I like the rearrangement um, that Gabe went through about how these, um, these uh, uh, the, just kind of the, the reorganization of, of the chapters in general makes a lot of sense. I think that, that, that does make it, uh, we kind of all got used to it, but I remember the very first time I ever looked at that, so thinking like, wait, where's what? But this, this I think is, uh, is a good improvement. Um, so they're the same, but they're, you know, how they are met in practice will be different in many instances. Um, so I've kind of tried to, to outline how I think some of those changes may manifest in, in designs. So this is the Cliff Notes version, because um, Gabe went through the detail. Um, but as far as 5.3 is concerned, green infrastructure, um, it has to be used to meet the criteria. Uh, tables 5-1 and 5-2 summarize the application of each BMP, and, and to a lesser extent, 5.3, which is only to be used with the waiver. And uh, some BMPs, uh, as you saw in these tables, they, the new uh, drainage area limitations that will come along with these, and I think that's going to um, be one of the points where you'll see some changes. So going back to the DEP's definition for green infrastructure, remember in the in the top there it says manages stormwater close to its source. Um, so that's where this drainage area limitation, at least in my mind, um, kind of gets to that part of the definition. So the dry well, as was pointed out earlier, has a one acre limitation. Um, that's not a new requirement. Um, that was always there. Um, pervious pavement has this three to one ratio. I'll discuss that uh, momentarily. Um, and um, then MTDs, small scale bioretention, infiltration basins, sand filters uh, have that 2.5 acre uh, drainage area limit that I'll, I'll talk more about from uh, table 5.1. So that is kind of the important point here, if you will that I think is going to have um, implications on, on design. So back to the pervious pavement, I saw a question earlier about, you know, do people use porous pavement in main drive aisles structurally? Is it is it equivalent yet? Um, a lot of manufacturers will say yes, but I think in practice, most people will say no. So here's a, a photo of um, 
a, a parking area where the parking area is very similar to what Brian had a photo of. In this case, kind of interesting, the parking stalls are actually porous concrete and the standard, the drive aisle is standard asphalt. Um, and so the three to one here would be this this design, if, if you see it on the right here with the, the laser pointer wandering around, would certainly meet that. Um, you just don't want to have more than three times the standard pavement running to the porous sections, as I understand it. <clears throat> um, so this is a new, um, something new here that I think is going to make some changes. Um, the 2.5 acre maximum contributory drainage area. Um, this is outlined in 5.3b. Um, during the discussions, and if you read the proposal documents, you'll see that that a one acre limit was uh, floated, discussed, um, and it it it's, it arrived at 2.5 acre, and they they talk about that. In, in the comment response, you can look at that yourself. It's 2.5, and that's what that's what matters. Um, I guess it goes without saying that that this is not going to have anything to do with um, a, a development that's smaller than 2.5 acres. It probably isn't going to affect the, the design there. Um, but in larger applications, and I saw a question earlier about warehouses, um, this this will definitely um, play in. So, uh, in my opinion, this this will encourage, and by encourage, I mean require designers to distribute BMPs throughout the site um, a little more than they would otherwise, which is a very good thing for a number of reasons that we'll we'll talk about later. Um, so, in general, um, this this requirement would have the effect of decentralizing uh, stormwater systems. So, you might tend to see more BMPs and more smaller BMPs. So here's a couple examples from the cover slide. A small um, rain garden built within a residential area. You can see the residential buildings around this. Um, uh, it's a client of ours. Um, and um, they have some, some pretty good systems um, aesthetically and functionally. Um, and then another uh, Princeton Hydro project uh, design project actually in the bottom right where we might this was a retrofit but where you might see these um, uh, fit into um, uh, parking areas and, and smaller um, urbanized areas um, this is a another design project the Princeton Hydro design project just trying to get a look at what what some of these things might look like um, honestly, I'd have to go back to this design, and it's been a long time to to see whether this would this design would comply. Um, probably some of these systems are over two and a half drainage, um, two and a half acres of drainage area. So you see vegetated basins here, here, here. Um, smaller systems in the parking lots, um, rain gardens, and then there's been also some some questions on. Um, capture and reuse this this project actually does have capture and reuse system i mean generally you don't see too many of these in, in the northeast because um you 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 need a cost effective um use for the water and water is cheap and we get a lot of rain here so it's often hard to to warrant that um that expense um this site in particular uses it for irrigation of the landscaped areas um the turf grass areas so they did have a use, um, uh, but it, it's it's hard to con, uh, convince people to do that. So I see some comments on that, and that's exactly what was going on here uh, was is capture and reuse for irrigation. Uh, so what are the developments actually going to look like? How will they visually be different, functionally be different? Um, again, it, this will affect large scale commercial. I saw a comment earlier about warehouses. Certainly, we see a lot of warehouses right now um, uh, going in, being reviewed, and this is something that will, will I think, change the way most of those look. Um, also, residential projects, so no more big basin at the bottom of the project. There may still be a big basin at the bottom of the project, but there'll be other things as well. Um, so here's a development where you have um, 
a large, this is probably a combination infiltration detention basin, but you've got a 30 acre drainage area. And this is the only stormwater management measure in this development that I know of. Um, so this is something that's gonna look uh, materially different. Um, this is another development. This one's on paper at the moment um, in the approval process. This is actually not, not in New Jersey, but as an example, you have a site here, mixed use, uh, mostly apartment, uh, townhome or uh, residential um, uh, facility. And you've got three stormwater systems, two rain gardens, an underground system. And, you know, I'm, I'll just point out this one. Um, you've got a drainage area here. Um, going to this rain garden, the rain garden itself is about a third of an acre, which is substantial compared to its contributory drainage area. But the drainage area is over three acres. So this is something instead of this, you, you'd see you'd see presumably at least two uh, rain gardens because you're over that two and a half acre um, uh, limit. So motor vehicle services, I did see some questions about this uh, early on. Um, Gabe went through this in great detail, so I'm gonna kind of skip over this, but it's that combination of, um, you know, inclusion of gravel, uh, you know, gravel uh, parking and drive aisles. Um, so these services now require 80%. So your standard pavement would fit into this. Um, what's interesting about this is not just what it includes into the water quality requirement, but what it excludes. Um, so um, standard pavement, driving parking areas, yes, of course. Gravel and dirt parking areas, this is new, yes. Take some of the ambiguity out of that. Rooftops, which are hopefully impervious, um, no, with the exception of the parking deck, as uh, Gabe pointed out. Sidewalks or other ground level non-vehicular areas like plazas and things like you see in this little um, photo here would um, probably uh, uh, not be included, based on my understanding. <clears throat> so another uh, common issue with gravel areas, I think will be clarified in some of the draft chapter five that's coming out. We see this a lot. Um, the tier 55, which is what en engineers, it's the, the reference that engineers use in, in calculating and, and, and demonstrating compliance with the rules is not particularly clear when it comes to proper curve number or CN value that's used for gravel. It's, it says, this is literally a snippet from it, gravel including right of way. Well, if you dig a little deeper, what they meant to say was include, including a pervious right of way. And I'm not putting words in their mouth. We've spoken to folks there and, and that's, that's, what, that's what that means. Um, and to Gabe's point earlier, you can see in this photo, um, you can get a lot of TSS that's running off in these areas can, can act fairly impervious. And if you're wondering, you should use a CN of 96 or 98 really for gravel areas. And that's per the draft chapter five BMP manual um, that's out for public comment, direct NRCS guidance, and, and I would add common sense to that. Um, so uh, municipal ordinance revisions, um, these two questions and answers here are more or less taken directly. And this was, I don't know if any, anyone answered uh, mentioned this earlier, but I think there's also frequently asked questions um, for the new amendments on the DEP's website that, that is pretty helpful. Um, the municipalities have to revise their stormwater control ordinance. Um, yes, and again, this is the minimum standard. Um, and how long do they have? Um, and I've got the, the clock there, as Gabe mentioned, the clock is, is ticking, um, and that date is March 3rd. Um, the good news is that also Gabe pointed out is they already have um, a draft model ordinance available on their website and municipalities as he also pointed out do have the ability to for example lower the threshold requiring stormwater management increase TSS um, the, the point is that they at a minimum have to meet um, what's in what's in the rule um, and one thing I just 
pointed out, um, in Pennsylvania, uh, municipalities, um, there, there's in many places a much smaller threshold to address what I call impervious creep. So you've got on the left, um, this is an old development where each house was built the same, same lot. They all looked exactly like this. And over time, you can still see the, the original roof line in these um, structures, but there's been additions. This guy probably has a brother that works at the concrete plant or something. And, you know, people improve their property and invest money in it. And in Pennsylvania, um, at least in some places, municipalities have a threshold as low as 500 square feet that requires um, homeowners to do some basic stormwater management, very simplified. But um, this does add up. And if you live downstream from a place where this is happening, then then you may be being impacted. You know, you can go from 16% impervious. And in these pictures, this is more like 62% impervious. So that's something that's an option. Um, so um, to try and wrap this up, the last two points I have, um, watching the time here, BMP manual, there are revisions and updates. New draft material is where you'd expect to find it on the DEP's website. And there are two sections open for public comment that was mentioned earlier, chapter 12, formerly known as um, Appendix E and probably more importantly, um, chapter five. Um, also, just spend a minute on this, chapter 13, um, that is now new as of a month or so ago, um, 7.852H, I think the wording of this has been revised a little bit, Gabe, um, and I. this is more or less a quote, design engineer shall assess the hydraulic impact I think th this was in the rules before, but I think maybe this, the, the wording here is a, a little different, but e either way, it's it's there now. Um, and the last bullet here, we don't want these infiltration systems um, not only interfering with someone's basement uh, or sewage disposal system, septic system, but it also can interfere with the BMP itself. And um, so chapter 13 is the culmination of a lot of um, hard work on behalf of the DEP and active engagement uh, stakeholder process. Um, and it's a very detailed way to ensure um, that the that, that this won't happen. So um, that's kind of the key point there and, and where I think there's there's been uh, been some issues that this is really going to help. So again, chapter 13 is new. What's not new is that a two foot separation from seasonal high groundwater is required. That minimum separation is now listed in in these tables five one two and three. I don't think any of them changed, but um, but they're there. But and this is the point of chapter thirteen. That doesn't mean it will work. Um, and what I mean by that is is just because you have two two feet of separation, um, that doesn't mean that um, that the system is actually going to work. There there's a little more to it uh, than just ensuring you have separation. And that's where um, the DEP has gone into uh, this effort. So to 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 um, to clear the mystery of whether you have a functional BMP or mysterious black hole where stormwater runoff goes to and just instantly disappears, um, and proper design of these this green infrastructure um, systems that infiltrate does require some basic knowledge of groundwater hydraulics. And and in defense of all my my fellow engineers out there. This is something that you, you don't get in your your degree. Um, so it's fair to say that that the, the designer may not have that that basic knowledge um, because it's it's not in in their curriculum. Um, but why it's important, and I'll try and tie this figure in. Seasonal high groundwater table is a, is a site restriction. It's one that you don't see when you look at the site. It's underneath the site, obviously. Um, where you are in the landscape matters, and Going back to the definition of green infrastructure and the drainage area limitations is going to force uh, developments to spread out those systems. And the, the more that you can concentrate or distribute stormwater through your site and presumably into different parts of the landscape, perhaps higher up in the landscape, depending on how big your site is, is going to help you. It's going to give you increased distance to um, the seasonal high groundwater table. Um, 
and that will be beneficial in its in its operation. So again, this is how we design green infrastructure that's going to infiltrate. We want it to be separate from the groundwater, but and so I've I've drawn a little cross section of a basin and a groundwater mound that's forming beneath it, uh, which will happen if the system is working. Um, but the problem arises when that groundwater mound intercepts the basin bottom, and that's where this uh, the system will, you know, almost practically stop infiltrating. Um, and this is what exactly what Chapter 13 um, provides pretty clear step-by-step -step instructions on how to avoid. And this is going to become more important um, if if and when um, infiltration uh, can be counted towards meeting your water quantity or, or peak flow requirement. So I tried to uh, speed that up and breeze through that a little bit. Um, hopefully I answered most of the questions that I had already seen. Um, and um, I don't know, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike, uh, Michael Pissarro there. And um, if there's any other questions for all three presenters, um, I think the three of us would be happy to stick around and, and answer them. All right, thank you very much, Clay. Um, I think the first question, Brian, if you could explain the continuing education credits for those who are interested. I know there's been a couple of questions about that. Yeah, sure. So we are we advertise this as, as including um, fee credits. Um, NJAWRA can offer those, uh, but it's a self-report. Um, so if you register, we have a record that you registered. Um, and we probably have a record of who attended here. And it's just a self-report. You would report those um, that you registered for this uh, seminar. And um, we had two hours of content here, so two hours of um, professional credit. All right, thank you. Also, all right. So there was a question about the turf pavers. Uh, are there plants that can be used other than just grass to better provide uh, absorption and infiltration? And would those surfaces be counted as an impervious surface or and or motor vehicle traveled surface? I think I can answer that. <laughs> Should I take that? Was that for me? Uh, whoever would like to take it. Um, well, I'll take a shot. Maybe Gabe can clarify. Um, but I don't think there uh, would be any issues with using something other than turf grass necessarily. If it was a, um, a dense ground cover perennial, um, even like a moss or something would work probably pretty well if it was low growing and dense cover um, for the spaces between the pavers. Um, I'll throw it over to Gabe in, Gabe in a second as far as if he agrees, but also as far as the surface, I believe it would be counted as an impervious surface as far as and a vehicle surface if cars are driving on it. Um, it's just that you're, you're then managing it to treat it and infiltrate it underground um, after uh, a rainfall event. Gabe, can you uh, make sure I said that correctly? Yeah, that, that's all correct. I mean, as far okay. as the vegetation goes, I think the biggest concern you have is what kind of traffic you're putting on it. You know, whatever vegetation you put. Gabe, you broke up uh, just a bit there. Sorry, I was getting muted there. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's just really about the vegetation survival. So you know, you need to put some sort of vegetation there that can withstand traffic, especially if you're driving cars on it. And that's, I think, why it's mostly defaulted to turf grass. It's pretty tough stuff and can, can withstand a lot of uh, stress. All right, but it would be counted as a motor vehicle traveled surfaces, uh, and you would have to do um, uh, water quality treatment for that too. Correct. I mean, assuming motor vehicles are driving on it, yeah. If it's, if it's a, just a walkway, and vehicles don't drive on then it's not motor vehicle service. So that really just comes down to the actual use on site. All right. But the, but the pervious pavement is providing that water quality treatment. So it's not like you have to do additional water quality treatment. It's providing the water quality treatment. But as far as um, the thresholds for counting as a major development, for example, um, it, would, it would go into that threshold. All right. right. All right, the next question. For redevelopment on highly urbanized sites, infiltration may be infeasible or undesirable. Is subsurface extended detention with slow release allowed under the green infrastructure regs? Well, you know, allowed is a, is a complicated question. Certainly, 
and if you can get a, a variance or a waiver. So in certain scenarios, yes, it could be allowed. But a subsurface extended detention basin is not considered green infrastructure. It's not within Table 5-1 or 5-2. So without a variance, it can't be used towards the water quality, or quantity, or groundwater recharge standards. All right. If you were doing, say, a bioretention basin with an underdrain or something, that would be fine. It doesn't have to infiltrate. You know, there were three possible options for what's considered green infrastructure, and infiltration was only one of them. So there are other options that don't infiltrate, but a, a subsurface extended detention basin is just not one of them. All right. Uh, and Gabe, this one is definitely for you. Uh, just the model ordinance, you mentioned there's a PDF version and a Word version. That's on DEP stormwater site, is that correct? That's correct, uh, njstormwater.org. And then you click the link for the BMP manual and it is one of the appendix to the BMP manual. I think it also might be on the right-hand side of the main page when you get there as what's new. I could actually look at that right now. It is. It is, okay. I think it is appendix D or something, yeah. All right, right. it is appendix D, that's right. Are there any considerations given to infiltration quality to water table aquifers used for drinking water supply? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that question means. Um, so there are some considerations in general in the rule that if you are in an area that we would consider high pollutant loading, that you can't do infiltration at all. So let's say it's uh, an industrial stormwater site or it's a, uh, a gas station or something like that you can't you can't an infiltration basin is not an option to infiltrate the runoff that comes off from say the, around the gas pumps um but generally the bmp itself if it's designed in accordance with the manual is going to provide treatment for nutrients and for tss so those shouldn't be a concern for groundwater contamination it's it's more things like hydrocarbons that we be concerned which is why it's prohibited in those areas where there's likely contamination from hydrocarbons all right and then I have a question. So the the regs are have an effective or an operation date of March 2021. And municipalities have a year to adopt their ordinances. If a municipality were to do that, let's say in July, would they implement those new ordinance, the, the new regulations to projects in August or September? If that's what the ordinance well, yeah, I mean, not only could they, if they adopted that ordinance and made it effective, they would have to. Okay. There, there's nothing requiring municipalities to make an effective date for that ordinance March 2021. It would be... No, they can make that as soon as possible, keeping in mind that the approval process for an ordinance does require approval from the county, which can take up to two months. So uh, it can't be effective until the county approves it. All right. All right. And Gabe, the co questions on the BMP, uh, comments on the BMP manual chapters, have that, has that been extended past May 1st because of uh, the governor's executive order or are those closing on May 1st? Okay, so we, we've started to have that discussion internally on whether or not we're gonna extend those, but no one has actually officially requested that we extend them at this point. If you do need more time, I certainly can provide some. The concern I have is that the longer we extend anything, the longer it will take for us to get these changes adopted into the manual. And the rule is gonna be effective March 2nd, 2021, no matter how long it takes us to get the manual done. So I really would like to have things done as soon as possible so it's available to designers as far in advance of that deadline so they're aware of what their requirements are. But you know, I understand the current situation and if you do need more time, um, then that's that's certainly a possibility. Even even if the comment period closes, to be honest, we've always taken comments up until the point where we actually are finalizing the chapter. So we've never thrown anyone else, anyone's comments out because they were a day or two late. That just hasn't happened. All right. Um, and I, this may be the last question. Uh, so if you do have a question, start typing furiously now. Uh, does the rule list what plants qualify as native plants for wet ponds? The rule certainly does not. That is something we will have to address in the wet pond chapter when we make those modifications. All right. 
Um, okay, you know what? There was another question, and this is for Gabe. Uh, please provide rule clarification about homeowner associations and please explain changes related to difference with RSIS development and municipalities. I'm not 100% clear on exactly what that is, but um, if you can address that. Or or the per uh, well, the first part, homeowners associations, the only thing I can think of in the rules uh, that deals with homeowners associations is there is a provision in the maintenance section of the rules that specifically says you cannot assign the maintenance of a major development, BMPs, to an individual homeowner in a major development. So if it's a residential development, you can't just assign the basin to the guy that lives closest to it. It has to be assigned to a homeowners association or any, the rule actually doesn't say homeowners association, any other permanent entity that you can come up with, but it can't be assigned to the individual homeowners. And then the, what was the second half of that question? Please explain changes related to difference with RSIS, comma, development and municipalities. So. It, well, common development, we just made it clear in the rule by incorporating the exact language that's from the federal regulations about that in the MS4, federal MS4 regulations about common development, making it clear that common plan of development is considered one project for the purposes of determining whether or not something's a major development. Um, what else was there? <laughs> yeah. I think that is, but if the uh, person who asked that question wants to submit a clarification, uh, we'll be happy to address it. We have a few more minutes before uh, I think go to meeting will cut us off. Um, and I'm going to take that opportunity because I failed to mention it in the beginning. Um, here at the Watershed Institute, we have a number of green infrastructure practices from uh, Brian and Clay, I think, mentioned our green roof. We have porous pavement, we have uh, grass pavers, a uh, grass uh, cell uh, for emergency vehicles. We have rain gardens, we have a cistern uh, all on our property. So when we are back and open to the public, please come out and see, we will give you a tour. Uh, also beginning of this year in conjunction with the CBLP organization, we created a green infrastructure training course for engineer, for designers, installers, and maintainers to sort of get this stuff done and right. Uh, we're going to have another course probably at the end of this year, beginning of next year again. Um, and that's sort of modeled off something going out through the Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, so those are some opportunities. And then, uh, Gabe, I think you mentioned, and I just wanted to point out, uh, sort of the interplay between these rules and RSIS. Um, I'm of the strong opinion that the Clean Water Act and the Stormwater Rules aren't limited by RSIS, and so municipalities who do go stronger can apply that. That's actually in litigation right now in the appellate division. Um, but I just wanted to sort of point that out. And I know your model ordinance, and maybe even the comments in the rules indicate that at least on certain circumstances, municipalities can enact stronger ordinances, whether that's a reduced trigger or stronger treatment requirements uh, that they so choose. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, and when I was mentioning RSIS, I should have also added that RSIS does have their own uh, provision for doing something different than, than was strictly written in RSIS. I think they call it special and a special area waiver or special area standard, something like that. So you can go to DCA who administers the RSIS and, and make an application to get one of those special areas and you can make the stormwater management standards slightly different in your community or in a portion of your community if you do that. I think there are a couple. Um, most of them don't deal with stormwater management. But I think maybe one of them does. Yeah, I think there are two. I think they're in yeah. South Jersey. Um, no. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, Brian, Clay, I see, Dave. I see one question here that, that uh, Linda Brennan just added about how long it took for counties to get grant approvals for the ordinances last time. So I would just point out that the both the Stormwater Management Act and the Stormwater Management Rules outline the, the process for getting uh, your, your ordinance approved by the county. 
So if the county doesn't act, and, and I'm going from memory here, so make sure you take a look, but if the county doesn't act within two months, I think it's automatically approved um, to either approve it or reject it, or they have to conditionally approve it within that time period. But if they don't act, I think it's automatically approved. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, Clay, Brian, and uh, Gabe for putting this together and spending your time. Tendees, thank you very much. Um, we will have these PowerPoints available. We'll send out a link to everyone who registered. Uh, we have also recorded. I unfortunately didn't start recording right at the start. Uh, I think I started a couple seconds into Gabe's presentation, um, but that there will be a link to that. So again, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, have a good evening. All right. Take care, Mike. Thank you. Take care.